And my intention was to talk to you a little bit about the historic roots of the Arab revolutions of 2011. Now, the revolutions sweeping the Arab world this year have caught the rest of the world by complete surprise. We had the example of the communist regimes of Eastern Europe falling after 1989, but the Arab world seemed to get entirely left behind by that wave of democratization. In fact, all the Arab regimes that were in power in 1989 were still in power at the beginning of this year, with the exception of Saddam Hussein. Some blamed Arab culture. Others said Islam was incompatible with democracy. But most agreed that the Arab world was going against a global trend of greater democracy around the world. But the events of 2011 have decisively undermined this notion that the Arabs aren't ready for or don't want democracy. The demands for political freedoms made by protesters in North Africa, in the Middle East, and in the Persian Gulf over the past few weeks and months all really underscore this broad-based appetite for democratic rule. They've been repressed for decades by governments that denied them their, their basic freedoms, and they saw their countries driven to some of the lowest levels of human development. Now millions of Arabs have reached the breaking point. They're tired of their corrupt and autocratic governments, and they've watched them, these governments enrich themselves at the expense of their citizens. People across the Arab world understood the despair that drove Mohamed Bouazizi, the vegetable seller of Tunisia, to set himself on fire in protest against an unjust and corrupt government. And the solution the Arab peoples are seeking today is the right to choose and to change their rulers by the vote. Now, what most people in the West don't appreciate is that the events of 2011 have deep historic roots in the region. It goes right back to the 19th century. Arab reformers have debated the merits of constitutional government since the 1830s, and they've taken active steps to try and balance autocratic rule with constitutions or elected assemblies as early as the 1860s. Even in the 19th century, interestingly enough, it was Egypt and Tunisia that led the way. And ironically, given our present day doubts about the role of Islam in politics, the person who really initiated the discussion of constitutionalism in the Arab world was in fact a young Muslim cleric or an alim named Rifa al-Tahtawi. Tahtawi left his native Egypt in April 1826. It's a wrong debate. Now it's true that Islam as a political force can and will play a role. It will be different from country to country. Uh, the, 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 the cards are laying different uh, in, uh, in, in each country. And yes, we, we will have to look at that. My guess is that, first of all, and I agree completely with uh, uh, Eugene, is that now that bin Laden is dead, he was already redundant, now he's doubly redundant. Jihad in the Arab world was dead 10 years ago, if not 20 years ago. It had some, you know, uh, a, little, a little upwards spring after 9-11, uh, but very shortly in the Arab world. It moved to Central Asia, to Afghanistan, Pakistan, where the, where the situation is completely different. They were not present on Avenue Habib Bourguiba in Tunis. They were not present in Cairo. They try a little bit now to, to, to send to the world all kinds of communiques, etc., because they don't have a social constituency, they don't have, they don't mobilize the people, so they have to, you know, they're now a fax machine business. And who is taking up these things? The West. We're obsessed with Islam. Mm -hmm. We should get over it. No, yeah. but I, I really mean it, and it's getting me, you know, I'm for you. <laughs> And that's why your lecture was so good. I mean, it's, it's true. Islam is there. It's part of the cultural fabric. It's even part of political movements that will mm -hmm. play an influential role. But they're moving much more, and that's how I'm going to finish my, my answer. They're going, to much, they're going to move into what we have known here in Europe as a, a Christian democratic movement. They will play by the rules of democracy because they have learned at their own expense. Mm -hmm. And most of all, because they were, everybody was repressed badly in these countries. But the Islamists double, double. 
they paid a very high price, an incredibly high price, and they know, they all agree now, that the democratic rules of living together are the best to organize a polity. My view is people keep saying, what can we do in the West? What positive thing can we do in the West? And I think the best thing the West can do is not interfere at the political level, take away agency from those who are bringing change to their own systems, but to do everything at the economic level to help the new successor governments succeed in the eyes of their own citizens. What does that entail? It would be a kind of, pardon the Americanism, a Marshall Plan. You know, a plan for the deliberate reconstruction of war-torn or revolutionary-torn societies. This would involve lightening the debt burden of Egypt and Tunisia. What they're paying in interest rates on government debt to outside funds is crippling. And it will be a terrible burden for every successor government to deal with. If there is, and again, it's a hard time to ask Europe to be generous. They're very generous in dropping bombs on Libya at the moment. But ask them to open their markets to Tunisian tomatoes, you know, flowers, um, opening larger quotas for the produce of these countries, taking such measures to encourage foreign direct investment in the new democracies to encourage job creation. If there were a meaningful investment by the West in the new democracies, it's not just benevolence. The Marshall Plan never was. The Marshall Plan was an attempt by a very industrially comfortable post-war America to bring the rest of the world up to a standard where they would be good trade partners. It was in America's economic interests mm -hmm. to invest in war-shattered Europe. And it is in Europe and America's interest to invest in revolution-shattered North Africa. And I think there lies you know, the, the possible cooperation that would turn around many years of suspicion, of domination, and might be you know, a really meaningful gesture to try and help consolidate change. The problem is that at the, at the wrong time of demogra demographic transition, when a lot of youngsters went to school and then came on the, arbit the, 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 market. the job labor market, they found that, that uh, the, the economic developmental projects that, that were installed were actually uh, not of the type that were creating uh, jobs in the country itself. So, so what you're saying is, well, because my question was, look to the future, is that oh, yeah. these, I, yeah, yeah, but that, well, is, I, that these countries have yeah. to change uh, their, their ideology. Yeah, well, you know, after the financial crisis of 2008, finally, I would say, alas, uh, we can talk like, please get over neoliberalism and try to get some economic sense. Mm -hmm. um, some would say, let's go for a real revolution and also not just a political revolution, but also a social revolution, which would include also more economic uh, uh, changes. But, you know, even though that would be, you know, we can wish for that. I think it's going to be a little bit hard for small countries like Tunisia to do it on their own. So mm -hmm. what they can do, I think the idea of a, of a big Marshall Plan is, uh, is a good idea. Well, the idea would really be to try and bring this region that over the past 20 years has been the one part of the globe that globalization just forgot. It just went right over the Arab world and looked for more stable, more profitable markets yeah. in Asia, Southeast Asia, it's very I'm, I'm not 100% uh, sure about that, because well, I, I do think that... Aside uh, from Dubai and a couple of other spots that are globalized, you, well, the rest. Uh, well, you know, just to give... When you look at the, one of the indexes of globalization, the Bertelsmann uh, Index, mm -hmm. uh, Jordan is the seventh uh, most globalized economy in the world. Which goes to show you what's wrong with the scale. <laughs> no, because, I mean, Jordan benefits zero from the global economy in terms of job creation or foreign direct investment. I'm not sure. I think there's, there's a certain very small percentage of Jordanians uh, uh, taking the benefits of that globalization. Ah, huh? But that's the stuff of revolutions. Of course. You that's know, why, that's why if you have the inequality like, yeah, coming in, indeed. You know, I'm talking about attracting the kind of foreign investment mm -hmm. that will give job creation. Yeah. And which has allowed the emergence of Asian tigers and for you know, Indonesian I, I, I always have dreamed and wondered, well, the, the, these all rich countries, I think they have a lot of money. So if you have really an Arab nation, why don't they invest it 
with the brother nations. Of I course, mean, that's one of the problems. I mean, they're always talking about Arab solidarity, but yeah. the economic ties between the countries are almost non-existent. I think the GCC in the Gulf is the first where they tried, but they're so dependent on, on oil that for the rest there's not a lot. Everything comes from the outside. But in, in North Africa, that's that should be the future. In the Middle East too, but you know, it, as long as there's so many political divides, you know, it's, yeah, you it's gonna be- You can't expect Arab investors to behave in a less rational way than investors from any other part of the world. And one of the things you would say about the Middle East until now is it's been autocratic, violent, you know, it's been war-torn. It's, it's a terrible place to invest money. And I'm not being funny. And so they, they, the need in the Why is it so terrible? Because, I mean, Egypt has not been be in sure. a war for many years. No, I mean. because you can't be sure that there are laws to protect your investment. You can't be sure that if you invest in a country that it won't be caught up in violence whether it's you know, internal violence or external violence or jihadi violence, it's just an area where people felt that the return on their investment was less secure, a higher risk. Mm -hmm. So take these revolutions to create so the, greater the, the, political to stability. To be specific, the, 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 the Saudis prefer to uh, invest their money in Western multinational companies. The or, in, or in Hong Kong or yeah. in yeah. I mean, yeah. anywhere in the world. Then and they did. In, in, with the other Arab countries, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. They're rational investors. So what you have to do is give people the confidence to put their money in a country where the system of law will protect investors, where it won't be subject to arbitrary rule, where you can move money in and out of the country without restricted banking regulations. I mean, there's a great deal that needs to be done to open these economies yeah. in a way that will allow them to benefit. From they the have to economy. be as competitive as China. I mean, that's not, not so easy. I mean, is it's closer. Sorry? Yeah. It's closer. It's closer, right? It, it has always been closer. I mean, and yeah. the Chinese are not flooding the south coast of Europe with immigrants. So there's even a self-interested motive anytime I'm on the continent, and I can remind people why it's in their interest to create jobs in North Africa of instead of yeah. hosting jobs yeah. in Belgium and Italy and Spain and France. Yeah, but, but to, for that, maybe you must be a little bit less rational investor. And, and uh, more, yeah, taking account of social uh, and, and other arguments. I think, yeah. I think you need to be creative. And let's not forget that Europe is an aging continent. Yeah. We have some problems with that. They have a very youthful uh, uh, demography on the other side of the Mediterranean. You know, a flight Brussels to Nice is two hours. It's so close. As if the, uh, you know, the, the Mediterranean the can be... Uh, it's only, you know, it's the Mare Nostrum, like the Romans said, it's our sea. I mean, mm -hmm. it's so close that there's all kinds of creative ideas that can be applied to that. As long as we don't give it to autocratic rulers that, that for every little thing get commissions and this and that, and that by the end nothing stays in, uh, in the country. So a new age of, of real cooperation between Europe and... The Arab countries. It is in our benefit, and I hope in North African benefit to do it. So, yeah.